Uh, I just entitled it Signs of the Times. And uh, certainly when we look around us at what's happening uh, in our world, we, uh, we know that the time is short. We know that the signs of what's happening in our world tell us that uh, God has already said these things would come to pass, especially more so as we come to the end of the age. And so uh, I want to just share with you from, uh, and this is just one list, but how many know there's, there's lots of uh, other lists in the Bible that tell us the signs of the end times? This is one of the crucial ones, I believe, and so I want to just share with you from Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 32. I'm going to try to, I may have to switch to the actual, the scripture's written down, but I got the Bible here in case I, I'm an, and, I'm, and I'm able to read. These things tend to fog up my glasses and then I'm not able to see. So if I, if I say something funny with the scripture, you read it up there and you'll get it right, okay? You'll know what I meant to say. <laughs> well, Father, first of all, we just ask that you would just open our ears to hear today the message that you have for your people. Lord, I have striven to listen to your voice and to hear what you would have me to speak this very Sunday morning, Lord, to those who you have placed under my care as a pastor and overseer. Lord, I'm thankful that you are the chief shepherd. You're the chief pastor of the church. But Lord, you give us opportunities to serve you in this capacity. Help me, Lord, to choose my words wisely and carefully. And help me, Lord God, to speak that which you would have me to speak, to challenge each and every one of our hearts today, those who are here in the building, those who may be listening online, those who may be listening at a later time, Lord, those who may be listening on their radios on 88.9, we just pray, God, now open our hearts to hear your word about the signs of the times around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we got an update on the signs of the time. Pastor Allen, uh, in your bulletin today, it was erroneously printed. Uh, we forgot to take it out. There is not a hymn sing tonight. So as they've been doing this the month of August, but not tonight. Did last week, actually, the first week of September. So you can still come and, and walk around the church and pray and sing some hymns if you want to. Okay, but there's not an official meeting of hymn singing tonight. Well, it's good to see all of you. We weren't sure, we weren't sure how it would go coming indoors. I know and I just want to thank you. I, I know that one of, one of the things in, is that we, we have so many different thoughts and opinions. You don't know who you can trust. You certainly don't trust anybody that doesn't know the Lord necessarily. But, uh, but it's hard to know, isn't it, what the truth is. It's hard to know because there's so much, there's no, so much lying. There's so much, you know, just, just false information sometimes. And then sometimes, how many know that we think we're smart, but we're not smarter than God? And so, uh, but we want to do the best we can to uh, obey the laws of the land. I think we're supposed to do that. And, uh, and I know I might, if I start choking, if I pass out because I can't get any air in here, I may have to take this off to finish up. But uh, that's not meant to say I, I don't appreciate you keeping yours on. And I would do, if I can possibly do it, I will keep it on. Signs of the times. And uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Scripture will be up there on the board for you. God's wrath against sinful humanity. How many know that God does pour out his wrath upon mankind? He has, obviously, the flood was the largest outpouring of God's wrath upon sinful humanity. He's promised never to do that again. But still, there's time to time, and God deals with people. He deals with individuals. He deals with nations and, uh, and people groups. And, and how many know that... Uh, that it, it's important. It's important what we believe. It's important that we Christians be salt and light to the people around us. Who, who, else, is, who else is going to speak into the, the uh, culture? Who else is going to speak into this nation if the people of God don't speak, if the people of God don't stand up and proclaim, amen, that God is still a righteous and a holy God. And so uh, we look at this today. Verse 18, it says, the wrath of God is being revealed. The wrath of God is being revealed. It has been revealed in the past. It will be revealed ultimately in the future, but it is revealed even as we go along. I believe America has great potential. This is my personal belief. I believe America has much blood on our hands, but 62 plus million babies that we've killed since Roe v. Wade. 
That blood is on our hands because we have sinned against great light and knowledge and understanding, more so than other nations who have not had that capability to read God's Word and to understand God's Word concerning this. But, but God help us. There's still hope. America still, America still has many good things. We could, we're covering a lot of the bad things today, but there are many good people in this nation. God always has a people. You know, Elijah at one time thought he was the only one left, and God let him know, nobody, you're not the only one. I still have a people who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And I want to just proclaim to you today that I know amidst all the chaos, it could seem like everybody's against God, but they are still God's people who are hungry for Him, who have their eyes on Him, and are wanting to serve Him and to live for Him and give glory and honor to His name. Things are very difficult. It's hard sometimes to see what's the truth and to know what to do. But God will guide us. God will guide you. He'll direct you. He'll guide His church because He always has and He always will. But He said His wrath is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Can I say to you, when a wickedness is allowed to go on, it suppresses the truth. The longer it's allowed to go on without being contested, the more the truth of God's Word gets suppressed. That's why the people of God must let your voice be heard. We must not be silenced during this time. I'm not just talking about just because we can or cannot come into a house of worship. We need to speak up in the marketplace. We need to speak to the culture. We need to do it gently, but we need to do it firmly and say, thus saith the Lord. People need to be reminded that there is a God in heaven. Whether they believe in Him or not, there's still a God in heaven, amen, who they will one day account to for their life. I was reading, reading this last week that it's interesting that even atheists, even atheists are saying that they, they need Christianity to thrive. They recognize, even though they say we don't believe in God, it's pretty interesting, yet they realize that, that America and nations cannot thrive apart from the Christian principles that are laid down that help us to thrive and help us to live godly lives and help us to live peaceable lives with one another. And so they, they've had to come to a place uh, of acknowledging that. Some of the most avowed atheists have said that it's necessary, Christianity is necessary for a nation to run on good principles and to have good things happen. Now look what it says. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, God's saying this. It's plain. Because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. God has revealed Himself. I believe every man who was born, God, God is placed within us. We don't know all. We don't know the plan of salvation. We may not know about Jesus in particular and what He did for us. But there's an innate thing that's been placed in it that there is a God. There is someone that is above and beyond us and our capabilities of our humanness. There's a God in heaven who created all. He says the, the invisible things in, in the nature. You see God, you do see him in the nature. You don't see him as literally as face to face as we see each other. But he says these things are a sign to you that there is a God and that you are without excuse for rejecting me. The next slide. For although they knew God, this is interesting, although they knew God, and uh, interesting, they neither glorified him as God. Uh, they just reject, you know, man wants to do their own thing. That's the problem from the very beginning. That's the, the lie that Satan sold Eve, and it's been passed all the way down. You know, if you, if you God knows if you eat this, this fruit that you'll be as God. And, uh, and they still, man wants to be their own God. They want to do their own thing. But it says, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. It, it's so important, church, that we, we are thankful to God. We will not understand all that comes our way. We will not understand all that's happening in this world today. We will not understand why some things do not seem fair and, uh, and why God would allow some things to happen. But we need to give thanks to Him. He's the mighty God. He has a plan. He has a plan for every one of our lives. Amen? And, and, he, and he didn't promise us that it would be easy. There would be tough times. There would be difficult times. There would be things we don't understand. But yet God has a plan for our lives. And so we, we surrender ourselves to him. And we say, thank you, Lord, for your plan. I know that you have my best interest. But it's not just about my best interest. It's how God will use me to help you too. And he'll use you to help others. You see, it's not just about ourselves. It's about being used of God to reach others and touch others and to help others. God wants to use us during this time of crisis. It says, they didn't give him thanks, 
But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Once, once you reject God, once you say, God, I can fix it myself, I can do it myself, I don't like your way, I don't believe your way, I'm going to be God, I'm going to play God, I'm going to do it my, my way. He says, and their, their foolish hearts were darkened, and although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Does that seem like that's happening in this world today? I mean, some of the wisest people on planet Earth, you think, intellectually speaking, are doing some foolish things <laughs> and making some foolish proclamations. And, and may I say to this, no matter how bright you are, whether you're an Einstein or whether your IQ is in the, in the toilet bowl, so to speak, when you know Jesus, you have what you need. Amen? And he can speak to his people. And, and it can be that the one that doesn't have all the intelligence necessarily is the one that's speaking the truth. I wonder today, because here's one of the, one of the problems we may have, is if you, if you, you can go on TV, you can go on your devices, and there's all kinds of prophecies coming forth. There's prophecy, one you read, it says that there's going to be a great revival in the land, and, and I want there to be a great revival, and there needs to be a great revival, and I pray there will be, and I believe there will be, but I believe there will still be an intense wickedness in the land at the same time in these last days. But then you read the next prophet, and he comes and he says, nope, America's gone too far. We've gone over the brink. There's no hope. Judgment has already been decreed, so there's no use to even pray. Well, I'll tell you what, I believe we should always pray that God would delay judgment. We may not know, and even if he has decided and we, we don't have that info from him that it's no use to pray, he always tells us to pray. He wants us to pray for one another. He says that we need to pray. Samuel said, you know, how can I sin against God and not pray for you? And so uh, we need to pray for one another. We need to pray for those in authority. God never said, stop praying for those in authority. He just said, pray for those in authority over you. And so until Jesus comes, or until God pours us out, whatever happens, we're, we're, to be, we're to be working in the kingdom. We're to be loving people, reaching out to people, being the church of Jesus Christ. And so he says, although they claim to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Verse 24, Therefore, therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And, and when I say, there's a couple of things, times here where it talks about God giving people over. It's a, it's a sad day. God knows the heart of mankind. He knows the deceitfulness of the heart of mankind. And what he's saying here is, is they have chosen, they've made a choice, they've set their path. They're not going to change. And so I'm going to give them over to do what they've already determined to do. They've rejected me, they've rejected my call on their lives, and so they're going to willfully sin against my holiness and purity. So he says he gave them over to the desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And all of these first few things here have to do with sexual immorality pretty much, but let me just say this. Even in some churches today in America, so-called Christian churches, they're embracing what God calls perversion and saying it's all right. And God help us. It is not all right. God has not changed His mind. His Word is very clear on these things. And so we need to be careful that we don't, even in trying to win somebody, kind of, well, ease them in or something, we need to speak the truth. God has spoken, amen, and His Word takes precedence over what man thinks. He says, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Now, verse 26, Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for, relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Uh, let, let me just say, church, I believe because the church didn't take some stands early on when immorality was just mainly thought about, or at least we were being told that we should just embrace it, it's okay. We don't need a marriage license anymore, we can just live together. The, the smart people, the psychologists and all those smart people said, this will help people kind of, you know, 
work it out and see if they need to get married or see if they should get, and it'll help marriages. It'll, it'll strengthen marriage. How many know that's a crock of baloney? <laughs> God knows how things should be run, and he already decreed that we need his, his plan for the family is one woman, one man for life. Now, we know that we live in a broken world, in a broken society. That's no indictment against you who may be here today or listening online who have had a failed marriage. It happens, and it does. But we need to, we need to strive with all that is within us to say, God wants marriages to last. He wants marriages to be put together. First of all, if you're a Christian, if you love Jesus, one of God's, God's mandates for you is don't be messing around with unbelievers. Don't, don't be dating those who don't love Jesus. Sometimes it works out, but I've been doing this for 40-some years now, and I found most times, whenever it usually seems like a young lady, she thinks she's going to win that guy to Jesus once they get married. Oh, they, she may, but it may. I read of one just this last week. 42 years she prayed for her husband, who finally got saved. But you know how I believe God has a better plan for our lives, and so, so be very careful. We shouldn't be yoked together with unbelievers. This uh, progression, progression that is as it goes, if, if we don't speak out when, when this sin is happening, if we don't speak out when, when something's going, see from the very get-go in, in my last church, I had an incredible relationship with, he was known all over Oregon as one of the most avid homosexual advocates. And he had a, when the AIDS crisis broke out, he had an AIDS house about three blocks from our church. The guys from the AIDS house, they all came by our parking lot day by day, going to a little store to buy candy and stuff. I went to the AIDS house, spoke with them, uh, developed a relationship with this guy who normally he wouldn't, you wouldn't think that would happen. And he would actually send those guys to me to counsel them and to pray with them. And he knew what my counsel would be. And, and yet, yet he sent and, and allowed them to come. And they would come to the service. And, and it was when we didn't know yet how AIDS would be spread and and me and other men in my church, we would, we would kneel at the altar and we'd put our arm around these guys and we would just love them. We would speak the truth in love. We'd speak the truth in love. We'd pray for them that God would heal them, that God would protect them. We'd also say to them that you need to stop this lifestyle. It's an ungodly lifestyle. But let me say to you as we begin this in this thing, any sexual immorality outside of God's guidelines and parameters is sinful and it's wrong and it's damaging and it's harmful. And America is full of, you, you, look at, you look at what's happening on our screens and on your devices, it, it, the pornography that comes mainly, primarily through America is just incredible. God help us. Verse 28 says, furthermore, just as they did not like, did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. It's, a, it's like, Wow. You say, can it get worse? To a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. I, I'm going to make a proclamation to you this morning. I, I believe this could happen to an, any individual possibly. But I believe we're seeing in America today what we're seeing happening in America. Some things that have nothing to do maybe with sexual immorality, but just the total chaos and the total just nuts that things that are going on have to do because I believe some individuals have already been given over to a depraved mind. It's just unbelievable. Even you think even just common sense, how on sense, common sense would say you don't do that. That will not work. You don't help the cause of your people by burning down their businesses and, and all these other kinds of things and looting and rioting. And, and that how does that how does that help the cause? And yet yet they're actually given a right to do that. Where when we try to hold a, a Christian singing down in the gas work parks, they shut it down, put fences around it, use your tax dollars to shut out so the people of God can't come and worship God Almighty. But we can open the streets. No, nobody's making them wear their mask or anything to rioters and looters and just total anarchy and chaos. Can I say to you, church, I believe we have some depraved minds at work in America and around the world. God has turned them over because they've made their choice. They've rejected God as God and said, we want to do it our way. And God help us. We have this because of the breakdown of the family. That's why from the very beginning, the family as one man and one wife is what God intended. 
You can't procreate without that. And so we've gone so far that it goes further. How I many know oh, polygamy is coming into the picture now? Transgenderism and all this, it just is crazier and crazier as we go. He said they did what not ought to be done. Verse 29, they have become, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness. Now here, it just, this is just, a, I'm just going to read this rather quickly, but a list. Once you start down the slippery slope of saying, God, we'll do it our way. God, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't, don't tell us how to live our lives. We want to do it how we want to do it. You're in grave danger, church. And the nation is in grave danger. It says, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips slanderers. Now listen, we, we think about what's happening out on the streets and we think of all the craziness, but some of these things have to do, they can happen right in the church house. Gossips and slanderers. Listen to this. And uh, God haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. And, and I just, uh, I've always been amazed by this next statement there. It says, they invent ways of doing evil. It's not enough just to be evil like anybody else or what we've seen before. They invent ways uh, because their mind is so depraved at this time that, that they, actually, they actually invent ways to do evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Wow. Quite a list, isn't it? Does that list look like what's happening today around us? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it should not be happening with the people of God because we should be tuned in to His voice. And because we have believed in Him, we have accepted Him as our Lord and our Savior. He will guide us and direct us during these difficult days. It says, verse 32, although they know God's righteous decree, they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do those, these very things, but also to approve of those who practice them. You ever thought about that, that line there? It's, uh, uh, it, it's not that you don't necessarily do it yourself. Can I just give you one illustration? I believe today that one of the ways that we can approve of those who practice them is by not shutting off the knob on our TVs, by not going, not going to the movie house to look at trash that Christians ought not to be watching. Hello? And by the way, the ratings that they give to movies and stuff is man's rating. It's not God's rating. And God never said, I can't find it in his book where he says, there's an adult rating and a children's rating. <laughs> Listen, we know that children need to learn. They should learn from their parents, amen, about these things. Not from somebody else and anybody else. But, but listen, church, if we, if we do not turn the TV off, if we are willing participants on our devices... Then, then even though we may not act, do that act ourselves in a, in a little way, but we're watching. By watching, we're approving of what they are because by watching, first of all, they get the ratings, they get more money to do more stuff. <laughs> and so it's time, church. It's time for us to make a decision to not fill our minds with the garbage of this world, to not fill our minds with the impurities that are coming at us. It is a difficult time. I, I pray for you who are parents right now. I know that it's a, it's a different age than it was when I was a kid. I, I, I thought it was getting bad then, but it was very simple compared to today. You know, and where, where it's 24-7, uh, it's just there, wherever where you go, and you can access stuff that you don't, and not just uh, those concerning sexual immorality, but so many things we can access. And God help us, God help us, amen, to take a stand, to take a righteous stand, and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're not going to do what everybody else is doing. And we're going to stand even if we get laughed at, mocked, made fun of, even if they say you're just a hate monger, because that's what the world is trying to do. That's what Romans 12, 2 says. Don't let this world pressure you into its mold. And the world is trying like never before to say, you got to think like we think or you're out. <laughs> you, you, you don't have a voice. You don't really have an opinion unless it agrees with what we say. And if you agree with what we say, then it's okay. But otherwise... Just be quiet. <laughs> but the church of Jesus Christ must not be quiet. 
The pulpits of America need to stand up even now. And the preachers across America need to pe- preach the truth and say, Thus saith the Lord, with the authority and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We will not bow down. We will not cow down to this world and to the beggarly elements of this world. But in the name of Jesus, we will proclaim the truth. The only way, salvation through Jesus Christ, not through just anybody or anything. Put down your idols. Put those things aside and worship the true God, the one and only true God. Signs of the times. I want to just uh, transition here for a moment. I know that this... Even what I'm about to say has very very many opinions, even within God's people. But I'm going to say to you as your pastor, I want to take a stand. I want to go on the record as taking a stand. I believe that every born-again child of God should vote. You should cast a vote. And uh, this is why I vote. Because I can in this land of the free. You see, America is like northern nation in history. A lot of people say, well, I don't know if Jesus voted or Paul. They didn't have a vote. (laughs) They didn't have a vote. Oh, they still spoke. John the Baptist lost his head because he still spoke to a king, said, you can't have your your, uh, brother's wife. Got his head lopped off. Listen, listen, they still spoke. But listen, if we have the ability to speak, and one of the ways we speak, not verbally, but we ought to be speaking verbally too, is by casting a ballot. And if you're afraid verbally to speak, you can still cast your ballot in private, amen, and do the right thing. Because we can. Because if the righteous default, sin will rule. That's simply that. Something fills the vacuum. When we kick God out of the schools, when we kick prayer out of the schools, we wonder why things are such a mess today. It's because we have to ask God to leave. And what's going to fill that vacuum? It's not going to be a good thing that fills the vacuum because we have a warfare that's going on, church, a spiritual warfare for the souls and the lives of the generations to come. And the enemy, by and large, is, especially if you get into the higher college levels, is winning that warfare because the people of God have ceased to let their voice be known and to speak up. If we, if we default, I don't want to be standing before God and God say, Les, Why didn't you speak up? Why didn't you say something? Why did you just let it go on? I gave you a platform. You're a pastor. You don't all, all of you don't have the same platform that I have. Others have a much bigger platform. We will give an account to God for what we've spoken with the platform that God has given us to speak to this culture and society this day. This is why I vote, because it is my civic duty in obedience to God's command to be salt and light in this world and to do good. The scripture says that he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is what? It is sin. If you can do good by casting a vote, if you can have the opportunity to say the right thing, to vote the right way, to influence others to vote in a godly manner, do it. Do it. It's the right thing to do. I vote. This is why I vote, because I am concerned for the legacy that I leave for my grandchildren. I I don't want them to live in a world as it's going right now. I want there to be revival in the land. If Jesus doesn't come, I want there to be revival. I want the heart of America to be turned back toward God. And that's how I pray. I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, you can hear different prophecies, and it can be more confusing than good sometimes. But I simply know this. God calls us to work until He comes. He calls us to be salt. He says, occupy. And that's not a passive word. He says, you occupy, you be about the Father's business, and whenever I'm ready to take you, amen, I'll come. I'll blow that trumpet, have Gabriel blow the trumpet, Jesus will come. But until that time, just be about the Father's business, amen? And if, if you don't know, say, well, I don't know. Well, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come into everlasting life. And so until I die a natural death, or Jesus comes, amen, I'm going to preach and proclaim Christ Jesus is Lord, amen. I'm going to speak to the culture. We must speak to the culture and tell them, thus saith the Lord. They need to hear it. They need to be challenged. Uh, some of them who have forgotten, and they're telling us that people that are going down to, to Chad and to Chaz and to some of these places where, where these kids are, and they're not kids necessarily, some are 30, 40 years old. But there's an open heart with many of those young people. There's an open heart. If the church will look for the opportunity to speak into this culture's life, I believe God, God wants to do a great work. He always does a great work. I believe God wants to do a great work among the millennials. Millennials are by and large downcast as a hopeless generation, a lost generation. How many know God came, Jesus came to save the lost? 
What an awesome thing if God would have just a sweeping revival over that millennial generation and those who have come after them even. God wants to do it. And so I just simply know this. We need to occupy. We need to pray. We need to speak up. We need to do what God has called us to do. I want my grandchildren. I want the next generation. I don't want them to look back and say, Grandpa, or the next generation of pastors say, Pastor Les, what happened to you? Why, why didn't you take a stand for righteousness? Why didn't you stand against the cultural norms of your day and say, thus saith the Lord? Those aren't normal. Those are abnormal. What God says is normal, not what man says. Now, I want you to know, you need to understand today, whatever has happened in your life, because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not a perfect, righteous one of us who has never sinned among us sitting here in this congregation today or watching on live on YouTube. Listen, listen, we've all sinned, and we all have background, but God is the one who forgives, amen? He forgives and He forgets, but we must repent. There needs to be a revival of repentance and realizing in America that, no, we don't just, you see, the problem, I'm afraid that if things go really good and, and, uh, and it changes and it went really good, we would quickly just get back into the old mode again. Money's flowing, things are going nice, but God says you need to repent, Men everywhere need to repent. We need to say, God Almighty, forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for my complicity, O God. Lord, thank you for the blessings that you've given us. You have given us. You will give us. But Lord, above all else, I want a heart that's set right and a heart that's set on God and God alone. God, help us to repent. I'm voting for good against evil. I'm voting for every unborn soul that the Democrats want to murder using our tax money and an end to genocide. Let me just say, that's the only thing there's, we, we could do something of this, but I'm saying Democrats, because I tell you what, I'd, I've never seen a time when there's a very clear delineation between the two parties, Republican and Democrat. And I'm going to tell you something, they're all in. They're all in. They're all in with Prime Parenthood. They're all in for killing babies, up to, up to birth even. The other party is the opposite direction. Whatever you may think of Donald Trump, he has done more to stand against abortion than any other president that I've ever known in my lifetime. And, uh, and God help us, because if we keep murdering innocent babies, we're in trouble. And also, also, whenever you look at uh, uh, other countries, often, you, you may not know, that often our funds that we give to other countries for various things they try to tie it in with, you have to accept abortion too, and you have to do abortions on babies. I liked it a few years ago when Mr. Obama went to, I believe it was Kenya, and they tried to foster this on Kenya. The pastors in Kenya rose up and said, no, sir. <laughs> no, sir. We will, you know, they actually gave him the boot, <laughs> said, we're not going to kill our babies. God help us to have more that will stand up like that and say, we're not going to do this. We don't want your money. If that's what it takes to get your money, we're not going to kill our babies. God, if we don't cry, listen, if, if we don't cry out for those who can't speak for themselves, who is going to? God will hold us accountable. I'm voting for the right to praise God and speak His truth. That's my opinion, amen, without fear of reprisal. This is supposed to be a nation where we can speak Amen. We can have an opinion. And, uh, and we are supposed to be able to do that without somebody getting in our face, spitting in our face, casting us aside or, or screaming and hollering so we can't be heard. Amen. We're supposed to be able to do that. That's supposed to happen in our college campuses. But it's all got to where it's one-sided. You hear one side of the truth and the other side gets shouted down. But we must not be shouted down. We must speak anyway. We must speak up. I'm voting for equal justice for all against racism of any sort. I'm voting for the police. We must have law and order. How stupid can we be that we think that we can get by without law and order? Because of the intrinsic sinfulness of mankind, we will always need law and order. And that's part of why God has ordained authorities, if you read your scripture correctly, is because we need law and order. We need those who will make sure that things are done properly so that we don't just become a nation of vigilantes, each man doing what's right in his own eyes and, and, uh, and taking the things over when we shouldn't. I'm voting for the next Supreme Court justice. How many know that Supreme Court? You may not understand that or not today, but it matters who's on the Supreme Court. 
It matters concerning the abortion issue. It matters concerning a lot of things that if we don't have a conservative Supreme Court, this nation can be set in a bad path for years and years to come. That's how it works. I'm for and voting for the Electoral College in the republic in which we live. You should study sometime if you don't understand because that's a big issue last election. It's going to be a big issue this next election probably because there's going to be so much chaos that's going to be created. And that's the work of the devil, by the way. But listen, listen, you need to understand why that Electoral College is really a good thing. A good thing. And our founders, it's amazing to me that they understood that and saw that. I believe God gave them godly wisdom concerning that. I'm voting for the military and the veterans who fought and many who died so that we could enjoy this land of the free. I thank God for those who have placed their lives on the line. I know sometimes they've been sent into wars that we think were not right wars or weren't the right way to be, but they were going with the right cause and the right heart, and they're serving their country. We are able to sit here and even do what we do today because of those who have gone before us. Can I say to you, if the enemy gets the total upper hand, we won't have a free America anymore. We won't have the things that we have anymore. We won't have the freedom to even to do for sure what we're doing this morning. I, I'm, I'm voting for, for secure borders. I'm voting for the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms. I'm voting for the flag. I stand for it, but I bow to the Lord Jesus Christ only. There's only one person who we bow the knees to, and that's to the Lord. I'm voting for the institution of the family as God Almighty intended it. One man, one woman, a man for life. That's what God wants. That's what God desires. That's how things will run this smooth. Did you know that much of the chaos? Did you ever wonder, those, sometimes those young people out there, don't they have anything to do? Don't they have jobs to go to? Don't they have a mama or a daddy? My son is 40-some years old, but if he was out there doing that stuff, I would be grabbing him by the nap of the neck and pulling him off and say, listen, son, what do you think you're doing out here? You're my son. You don't do that kind of junk. You don't go looting and rioting and doing, wasting people's lives and killing people. Listen, we need to have moms and dads. We need to have strong families. That's why God intended that the family of God, the people of God, would raise the next generation to be another godly generation. And because of a lot of these sinful things that have happened, because, because of so many aborted babies, and because in different segments of society, the father is not in the home any longer, and over 50%, sometimes as high as 74, 78%, no father in the home. There's nobody guiding these kids from a your, your early age and what to do and how to live a godly life and please the Lord God. It's time. It's time that we vote for the family and say, God, help us. Help us, O oh God this institution of the family to become strong once again. I'm voting for just one person. I'm not voting for just one person. I'm voting for the future of my country, the United States of America. What are you voting for today? What are you voting for today? I want to just challenge each and every one of you today. You can go, I have some information here you can take at the close of the service. It has, I think, good information. It has basically the Democratic and the Republican platform, what it stands for, what they're saying. It's not a, a long, I mean, obviously, each one of these points is a lot of stuff behind it. You can go online and find that, too. But you'll see there's a very, there's a very delineated, it's never been clear, church. If you're a child of God and you want to live by scriptural principles at all, it's never been clear, I don't think, on what way to vote. I, I believe that we must stand up. We must stand for truth. We must stand. Is, uh, is there anyone here today who is perfected in the Lord yet? You have no sin, you've never sinned, and you haven't sinned. Yeah, I thought so. Let me just say, we're not electing a pastor, we're electing a president, we're electing senators and congressmen and congresswomen and all those. And, and they are, they're, they're not all Christians, and all Christians have sometimes a background. We haven't been perfect in our lives either. But listen, church, you need to make some decisions, you need to read the issues, you need to find good sources. Uh, FRC, Family Research Council, is a good one. Uh, they're what these papers are based off of. And uh, also on these papers today, we're three weeks behind, but you can pick up if you want to go back. But I'm, I'm giving you these so we as a church can join with others across America who are praying weekly for, for America and for the elections coming up in November. So you'll start at the bottom of the page, the first page here today. But I want to encourage you to pray for our nation, to pray for the elections, because it does matter, church. It does matter for our freedoms and uh, what we vote for. Can I just uh, have you look with me at Proverbs chapter 31, and I close with two scriptures here today. 
because of the signs of the times. This concerns today's actual, uh, when you get your papers there, today's actual uh, prayer time. There's, there's more scripture than what I'm reading here, is to pray for human life and human dignity to be upheld. We need to pray for mothers and fathers and children who have been af- affected by abortion. I'm so thankful for organizations such as CareNet. CareNet, if you didn't know, they haven't been since the COVID thing, but they were bringing a parking a, a mobile van out here in our church parking lot on Wednesdays and making available, and, and they, have, they have actual uh, offices in other cities in Washington and all over America, but they're making available for women who are pregnant to come and have an ultrasound and to give them and point them to good health care and to, to speak to them about keeping their baby instead of aborting their baby. They also, uh, something that if you might be in your heart as a church, they can give us training if you might want to be a counselor. I, I like what CareNet's doing. They're, they're especially too trying to bring in the father that often is left out of the equation, uh, period, maybe by his own wants or desires. Maybe he just doesn't have a voice in that. But they're bringing in fathers, and they're doing training to train them how to be a father. And the mothers, how to be a mother. It's rather than just say, well, you got to have this baby. You're going to hell if you abort this baby. We, ne- we need to not only curse the darkness, we need to light a candle church. And so uh, it's a great ministry. There's other things that they do, just powerful. And, uh, and so we need to pray they get, be able to get back in the parking lot here. They were, they're having more and more people come the longer they were there. And one day I pray that, that they'll be able to come into the city of Kent and set up a regular uh, office here in, in our city. But, but I say this. We need, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for them and, uh, and that God would use them. And we need to pray for those in public office to protect the rights of the unborn. We need to pray for those to, uh, and maybe just say, I, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at the, the very, I think the first or second day in office, Donald Trump overturned uh, what they call the Mexico City something, I can't remember. Basically it was saying, you get our funds, you promote abortion. And he overturned, billions of dollars was going toward that. That had been overturned by the previous president who went back to Dix. See, it matters. A president can come in, and they do do a lot of things. They can overdo what a previous president did often by his, by his uh, what do you call them, executive orders. They can reverse those exec- executive orders. And so right off the bat, right off the bat. And so God help us. If for no other reason, for the sake of the unborn babies, we need to see who our senators, our congressmen, who we're putting in office, who they are. Here's what I said, Proverbs 31, 8, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 2a, for everything there's a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die. This is a season, church, when we are on the face of this earth. What will we do with the life that God has given us? Will we, will we be bold and stand up and speak the truth? Will we be bold or will we cow down and be afraid to speak and let the culture and let the wickedness prevail? Or will we say, thus saith the Lord, I choose God over what man says. And will we, will we do the least that we can do? I often say, it's the least that we can do is to cast a ballot. It's the least. <laughs> uh, but we also need to speak up. You need, do you need to influence people? If you have godly influence, yes, you need to influence people. I, I know the rules of the church. I cannot, we cannot as a church endorse a candidate, supposedly. That's how it's supposed to be. But did you know that in those early colonial times, if you read your American history, that they're trying to revise now, <laughs> again and again, they're revising to take God and Christianity out of everything. But the pastors spoke up. They believed that it was mainly because pastors were speaking up that many of the, the founding fathers and the laws that were brought into place was because pastors spoke up and pastors preached and pastors prayed. They were invited even to the, to, the, to the councils of the Senate and the Congress and all the, they're invited there to pray. God help us to speak up in this day. It's our turn. 
It's our turn as pastors. It's our turns as evangelists. It's our turns as those, as a Billy Graham or a Franklin Graham now, who has a wide, wide audience to speak to those that God has given us to speak to. But then it's your turn, whoever you are, whatever your platform is, whatever your work is, wherever you are, it's time for us all to speak up and to proclaim that God in heaven is still in charge, that he still rules this earth, and we will give an accountability to him. And so we must, we must turn our hearts to God. There's a season to be born, a season to die. And uh, one of these days, we'll all go that way, unless Jesus comes first. But as long as we have breath, may God help us to speak up. Well, Dutch is going to come this morning, and I want us just to bow our hearts in prayer for just a moment here, if we could, please. Lord, Lord, I thank you for this Sunday, and I thank you for this first service that we have back inside of the building. Lord, we, we thank you for the opportunity we had to be outside. We pray that many of those who came, maybe because of the, the difference of the venue, Lord, that, that maybe they don't feel comfortable inside, we pray, Father, that you just speak to their hearts and that they would be able to feel comfortable to come inside too with us now, Lord, and worship you and give glory and honor to your name. Help us, Lord, as the church, Lord, during these uh, tremendous days that we live in, the opportunity that we have to do, for, to do good, Lord. Help us, Lord, not to squander the time. Lord, you said we need to buy up the time. Time is precious, Lord. We need to do everything we can to proclaim the name of Jesus and to speak to this culture. Lord, we need to do everything we can to do it forcefully, to do it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But Lord, help us to speak up. Help us, O oh God, to be aware of what's going on in our nation. And yet, Lord, to spend time in your presence, Lord, calling upon your name, crying out to you, O oh God, because you are the answer to every problem, to every situation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I wonder if uh, uh, Pastor Allen or Pastor Josh Mosing back there, I think I see you back there. Could you guys come and uh, if you have, there, there's some gloves out there somewhere you can put those on. You're supposed to do that, I guess, if you pass something out. But you can, I'd like, a, there's, I'd like to have each family at least to have one of these. It'll give you something to pray for, specifically for our nation, for the elections coming up. And, uh, and then, like I said, there's the back sheet is just simply the two parties and what they're standing for. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's lots of interesting things just it would say this what you hear coming out of people's mouth isn't really what it means sometimes you got that <laughs> you got to be a great discerner first of all and be careful who you listen to and what information you receive but there are good sources there are good really good sources for Christians to turn to and uh, and so we, we make those available to you but uh, but uh, God God help us could, could we stand together Dutch, just lead us in the song while they prepare. And, and while we're singing, they just come. And if you just want one of these, they'll, they'll give you one. I think they're trying to find the gloves now. Uh, let's just finish by worshiping the Lord. Praise God for-